I grew up in India and then went to America, did my higher studies, did most of my professional life in America, and moved back to India about a year and a half ago. And I wanted to write about the East and the West. What can we learn from each other? I just wanted to come up with this brilliant book. And then I found my biggest stumbling block. What is East? Is it India? Is it China? Is it Pakistan? Is it Bangladesh? Is it Vietnam? I mean, we are all so different from each other. And what is West? Is it America? Is it Britain? Is it Hungary? We are all so different from each other. And that's when I understood that generalities are sometimes dangerous. And the only thing I can do is to explain what I observed in my experience of moving between cultures. So the biggest thing is that there are differences. It doesn't matter whether you grow across countries or go across the street between parents and children, there are differences. So the point is, how do we overcome these differences? And especially in a business setting, what can we do with them? So I will tell you what I've learned through three stories. The first one is about a visit that my husband and I had to a high-tech park. And in India, right now, there is a huge influx of new buildings that are coming up. You know, there's a lot of companies that are coming in, so there's buildings being built. So we went, and this builder has spent a lot of money. There's Italian marble, beautiful wood, fantastic glass. And we were walking on the floor, and we realized that there's wonderful Italian marble, but the grouting between the tiles was all up and down. It just wasn't flush with the tile, which means you stumble sometimes when you walk. And more importantly, the whole aesthetic of the tile is taken away because the grouting wasn't good. So my first reaction was, darn these workers, they never pay any attention, they're lazy, they spend most of their time drinking tea, and et cetera, et cetera. But somehow that stayed with me, and I thought, suddenly about the person doing that work. I realized that this person has come from some neighboring village where he lives in a mud hut, where his whole goal in life is to probably buy a really high quality plastic tarp that can, he can put on the hut so that the children don't get wet when it rains. And he's never set foot in front of a building where there's perfect flooring. To him, a floor is good enough. So you have the tile, and they're jointed by this grouting, what are you complaining about? So when you understand that, suddenly you don't make them wrong. Now I see a fantastic business opportunity to start vocational schools all over India to teach people basic skills of carpentry, of masonry, of plumbing. And I think we can have world-class talent in that skill set that really gets exposure to what is perfection. So there's no point getting upset if you don't understand the problem. Now, the second thing uh, is a lesson I learned when I was planning an executive trip. I was at Intel, and we were planning this trip to India. You know, being the Western, very, very analytical company we are, we would have weekly meetings, and you know, where am I going to be at 8.42? Where am I going to be at 8.45? I mean, once you go to India, it all doesn't matter anyway. It all depends on the traffic, but nevertheless, we make our plans, we had our weekly meetings, and fantastic, this group was involved. We went there, I took all of them beautiful gifts, I got them some soaps and perfumes, etc. Had the wonderful meeting, gave them the gifts, and uh, as we were wrapping up that day, uh, the leader of the team, she came, her name is Nandini, she came and said, uh, uh, can we all take a picture together? I was like, yeah, 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 if we have the time, we'll take a picture together. And, uh, you know, it was about an hour before we had to leave. She came to me again and said, can we take a photograph together? So we were just still in some press meetings, things weren't done. I was like, yeah, yeah, we'll see if, if we get a chance. We were getting out the door, she came running to me and she said, look, the entire team is in place. You, you just need to come sit there for two seconds. We want to take this picture together. And by then I was like, what is this obsession with photographs, you know? I was like, okay, whatever, I rolled my eyes inside, not physically. And with a smile, we went, we sat down, we took the picture, we left. I was like, oh God, these Indians, 
they're obsessed with photographs. So went away, and fast forward 13 years, I hired Nandini to be in my team in Bangalore now, and a few weeks ago, she brought me that photograph. And she said, remember, this is the photograph we took. And suddenly, I understood that for them, a photograph is not just a photograph. It is a memory of the time spent together. And it is something that's carried forever and ever. And so I realized that in India, to make things work, you need to do the simplest things. Taking a photograph with the team you work with, giving a little certificate with the signature of the CEO, carry much, much more weight than the perfume I've given, because long after the soap is melted and the perfume is gone, the photograph still remains. It's the simple things that matter. And finally, one thing I observed in India when I went is people bring their personal lives into work all the time. Oh, I can't come because, you know, my neighbor's son is getting married, you know, whatever. There's 20,000 reasons and we have 50,000 holidays. So I said, what is the productivity? How do we ever get anything done here? So then I thought about, you know, when I was at Intel, I was in Portland, Oregon. Um, I had a new car. I was driving one day and I had an accident. And the car was total, but I was fine. So I came out of the car for air because it just was a shock. And, and those were the days of no cell phones. I couldn't call work and tell them I'm not going to make it to the meeting, etc. So anyway, uh, the police came, took the report, dropped me home, and somebody gave me a ride. So I went to work about a couple hours late. And, uh, but everybody came and said, how are you feeling? Was, is, did anything happen, the accident? I was like, how did you all know? I said, then one of my colleagues stepped forward and said, I actually was driving by and I saw you, and you seemed to be doing fine. So I came to work uh, because I didn't want to be late and told everybody what happened so that we could rearrange your meetings. I thought, how nice, how efficient. But something lingered in my head that day, and I didn't know what it was. And about a few weeks ago, I was supposed to have a one-on-one -on -one with my colleague, and she called and said, can I come a couple hours late? I said, okay. And she came, and I said, what happened? She said, you know, her best friend called her, and she wasn't, her dad wasn't picking up the phone. Since she's a neighbor, she went, to, went and found that the dad had a stroke, and that's why he wasn't picking up the phone. She rushed him to the hospital, you know, admitted him in the hospital, and came to work two, day, two hours late. I was a bit irritated. So it said, what would your friend have done if you didn't answer the phone? So she said, probably she would have called the other neighbor. I said, why didn't you ask her to do that? And she just looked at me with this blank face and said, I didn't even think about it. And that's when I remembered that accident in Portland, and I understood what is it that nagged me, is that I wish my colleague pulled over and came to me and just gave me a hug. Because sometimes, in our rush to get to where we want to, we forget to take the time out to help somebody who's in need. And it's okay to bring that into work, because that's what makes work really life. So with these three lessons, I understood something, that there are companies out there who actually can turn the weaknesses into benefits. This last point I talked about, bringing your home into work. There's a company called Sierra Atlantic. What they found is that every time they interview young employees, they would say, oh, I'll get back to you tomorrow because I need to check with my dad if the salary is okay or not, etc." So they realized that parents play a very big part in these kids making decisions. So what they said is that for you interviews, bring your parents with you. And they actually instituted something called Bring Your Parents to Work Day. So once a year, everyone brings their parents to work, and they celebrate. And in a country, in software services, where the turnover is very high, they've managed to retain most of their employees, because now the whole family is a part of this. And I think they didn't set out doing that, but just by paying attention to what is it the community wants, they actually create a business advantage. So from all this, I learned that the power of imagination lies in addition to dreaming something big. It also lies 
in observing what is not seen in front of us, what is not said. It is the poetry that exists in the pauses between words. If we pay attention to the culture, if we pay attention to the community, we can actually turn the things that we see as negative into opportunities. So I thought, for me, what is the legacy that I have learned? What is the legacy that I feel my forefathers have left for me? So I started looking at the life around me. Instead of some business books, instead of something, I started looking at the people I care about. And I have two fathers. One is my biological father, and the other one is who I call my corporate father. My biological father was a pediatrician. And the biggest learn lesson I learned from him is about love. I used to always argue with him. You had an arranged marriage. You didn't even know mom when you got married. What do you know about love? You know, it's about this looking at somebody across the room and your eyes lock and this fluttering of the heart and it's holding hands and all this stuff. To me, love was his passion. And he always used to laugh and say that whether you love and marry or marry and love, the real work starts after getting married. And... Um, you know, my sisters always used to tell me the story of my mom and dad always loved to go for a walk in the beach. And my mother didn't know how to ride a bicycle, but she used to love pushing my dad's bicycle. So every Sunday, they would go to the beach. While the kids were playing behind, they would walk with my mom pushing his bicycle, and two of them would chat. And when da my dad was 45, when my mother died, and he decided he would never marry again, because he said, I had my best friend, I have three daughters, I have a great profession, I don't need anybody else. And to me, now, when I think of all the things he wrote, the things he, had, he said, I understand that he understood love more than anyone I've seen who fell in love. And to me, whenever I drive uh, on Marine Drive in Chennai and look at the beach, I look at the two people walking with the woman pushing the bicycle, and that is my definition of love. And the other definition of legacy is what I learned from Andy Grove, who is a son of this land, who was a CEO of Intel, who I consider my corporate father. I interviewed him, and I asked him, what is, how do you grade yourself as a CEO? He thought about it and said, B plus. And I was kind of surprised. I said, in your regime, the company has become the largest semiconductor company in the world. And, you know, Andy is not quite a man of humility. And I said, why do you give yourself a B plus? And then he said something that was really interesting for me, that he said the true test of a CEO is not what the com about the performance of the company when he leaves. It is what happens to the company five to ten years down the line. It is, did he leave enough legacy, enough plans, enough products in place so that the company is successful much longer after he left? And he felt that he did not do a good job of leaving future plans. And that kind of an honest look into yourself and seeing what is my own contribution is something that I learned from Andy and I consider that my biggest professional lesson. So I think about what do young economies like India, like Hungary, like many other countries, what do we have to look forward to? And this reminds me of a story. I'm from the land of stories, after all. This is the story of an elephant who gets caught and taken to the zoo. Baby elephant goes to the zoo. Big rope, big wooden post. It's tight to the post. It tries one day to get out, can't get out. Tries second day to get out, can't get out. Tries for 10 days to get out, and it can't and it just resigns to its fate and just stays in the zoo. Years pass by, and one day a little boy comes to the zoo, and he asks the zookeeper, you know, why does this elephant look so sad? 
And the zookeeper says, because it doesn't want to be here. We brought it and, you know, we tied it and, you know, for 10 days it tried to escape. It couldn't escape and it just resigned itself to its fate. And the little boy says, but the elephant is this big, the rope is this small, and the wooden post is yay big. All it takes is for the elephant to yank, and it can be free. Why isn't it doing that? The zookeeper says, the elephant now believes it cannot get out. It doesn't see its own strength, that it has grown, it has become big. It doesn't see its own strength. That's why it's staying the way it is. And for me, when I see economies like India, we haven't realized our own strength yet. And I think if we do, I think we will create a world, in fact, where we don't follow norm. All of us, I think, should celebrate our differences, should hang on to our differences, and yet try to understand each other's language and we have the true opportunity to redefine success. And that is what I feel the new economies can contribute to the world. Instead of looking at success as the billions of dollars you accumulate in a bank, we have to redefine it as something that takes into account this idea of bringing work into life this idea of being there for each other, this idea of how do we contribute to the communities. And I have come up with an idea. One of my favorite quotes is that, life ought not to be measured in the number of breaths we take, but the number of moments that take our breath away. So really, really, the true treasure is in hungrily, greedily collecting these moments. You know, taking the time and savoring that little kiss your child leaves on your cheek, and that breeze that touches your face, that friendship you start, and that conversation you have. If we hang on to every moment and try to be billionaires of moments, and celebrate the people who are billionaires of moments and make them cool and rocking, I think we, as new economies, will not only create a new world, but make the difference in a way that we can't even dream of. So I invite all of you to join our club of billionaires of moments. Thank you. Thank you.